Okay. Okay, you should be seeing a map of uh, Hawaii kind of tipped on its side. Is that what you're seeing? Yes, it is. All right. So we will begin then. Yes, um, Kathleen and I decided, and it was in a, in a later email, Kathleen, how I was putting it up. Uh, the first night tonight, I'm looking at the these first uh, the, the newest island, Hawaii and Maui. And next time, uh, next week in, in Oahu and Kauai. So we're going to go in order of uh, most recent islands. Oops. And it's going to go too fast. I'm going to use my, my uh, <laughs> other key. So Hawaii's out in the middle of nowhere, 2,400 miles from Hawaii. Don't try swimming it. Uh, as you know, it's it's pretty far south, south of the United States, even with Mexico, Guatemala, about 2,700 miles from Tahiti, which is where these folks came from, San Marquesas. So in this area, so a long way away, but out in the middle of nowhere. So this is the folks I went with the first trip. Um, Teresa was my travel buddy in Romania. You may remember her from that presentation. And her two friends, Carol and Bill, in 2011, that was my first trip to Hawaii. And um, what was nice about that was that Teresa lived in Hawaii in, in Honolulu for, for 10 years, had a, a condo right down in Waikiki, which is now worth a lot of money. Uh, so she um, worked for the State Department and uh, volunteered on some of the other islands so got to know Hawaii well. So she was a great introduction for me to Hawaii because she showed us all around, made all our reservations. My second trip was with my son, James, who moved there later in 2011. And we went to the Big Island and Maui. Back again the next year, we went to Oahu and Maui. And my last trip was in 2019 with the big guy from Maui and his girl, Ocean, who were there for a few days with us. My, I was invited by my daughter from New Jersey, Beth, and her husband, Craig and Aaron, who is now 5'11", <laughs> all of a sudden he grew. So we had a great time with them as well. So we're gonna start not with uh, the trip in order necessarily, but we're gonna start down here on how the islands were formed because that's sort of an introduction to how these islands got here in the first place. So after that, as I say, we'll go to, uh, oh, oh, Oahu, I'm sorry, to Maui, Oahu, and Kauai. <clears throat> so the island of Hawaii is the big island, and it is the biggest island. Uh, it's bigger than all the others put together, actually. So where we're looking at is Kilauea, right here, where there's a wonderful visitor center for the Hawaiian Volcanoes uh, National Park. Actually, we did fly into uh, Kona and uh, out of Hilo. So here's our group at the observatory, the, the United States Geological Survey. As I said, since Teresa lived in Hawaii for 10 years, she volunteered at the Volcano uh, National Park uh, a number of years and knew people at the observatory, which is not the visitor center. It's where they measure the activity of the most active volcano in the world at Kilauea. So we were able to get in there as well. She still knew people who worked there. So that was a plus for us. So I say you might not get to do all of that. That is now closed since it's right on the edge of where the eruption is. So this is the, the Thomas Jagger Museum at the National Park Service and their overlook at the Kilauea Caldera, which is this huge spot right here and the smoking part that is still smoking. Halia, I, I can't ever pronounce all the Hawaiian words. Halima Uma U, which exploded again in 2018. As I say, we were there in 2011. So that's what it looked like when we were there and it was smoking a little bit. <clears throat> so in the, uh, in the visitor center, they have a topical map of what the big island looks like. And you can see the two big ones, Mauna Loa, Mauna Kea. And there, uh, Mauna Loa is still active a little bit, <clears throat> some steam coming from it. Kilauea, of course, is the one that's very active still. And the two that are dormant already, which I just got rid of too quickly, there we go. So from the air, as we flew out of Hilo, I took this nice picture of Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea. <coughs> in case you're wondering, maybe you never asked, does it ever snow in Hawaii? Yes, it does. 
those are big islands, uh, big, big uh, mountains. They're 13,000 feet. <clears throat> the, the one. And so they do get snow. What do you think? What is interesting about Mauna Loa but below sea level, it comes from the ocean. If you go to Mount Rainier, for example, or Mount St. Helens, those, are, those mountains are coming from sea level. Uh, so, but this one starts way here at the, the sea base. In fact, it pushed the base of the, the uh, ocean floor down as it began exploding. Uh, compared to Mount St. Helens, Mount Fuji, uh, Mauna Loa would be the highest, even though it's 13,000 feet above sea level, it's really 56,000 feet above the sea floor, making it the largest, uh, <clears throat> the largest volcano in the world. So if that's on Jeopardy, you'll know the answer to that. <laughs> so these volcanoes are different kinds. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't before I went there, but now I do. So the, the Hawaiian Islands are shield volcanoes, this kind. They, they're, they're kind of flat uh, from the sides. They don't erupt like Mount Fuji, like Mount um, uh, St. Helens did, or or Mount um, <clears throat> the, one, the one in Italy. Now it's gone out of my mind. Anyway, this moves kind of slowly. It bubbles down here, and it does have a lava overflow and a little bit of um, <clears throat> eruption, but it hasn't built up the pressure that's behind these. This is the basic kind that builds up pressure until it blows its top. Uh, the variation on it is if it has side vents as well, which of course these Mount St. Helens did. <clears throat> if you're interested, just a side note, if you're interested in volcanoes, one of the national parks, our national parks that's interesting to visit is Mount Lassen in, in um, Northern Cal uh, Cal uh, California, <clears throat> Lassen Volcano National Park that has all four types of volcanoes within the same park. <clears throat> I found that kind of interesting. And they do have a very good visitor center. <coughs> so this is what we know about the eruption here. Here is Kilauea. <clears throat> Every place you see the, these purple streaks are recent flows, uh, but it's flown all over here. Uh, as I say, Mauna Loa is not erupting at present, but it has fairly recently. Uh, you notice it came all the way down here within five miles of Hilo uh, just a few years ago. So uh, it was still active um, uh, pretty recently. And this one, of course, is still active, filling in all this land along here. <clears throat> so what makes a volcano a volcano? <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm gonna need some water. <clears throat> As I'm doing that, you can see that there are hot spots below in this hot magna in the Earth's interior and there are vents that come up through it. You can see that a new one is forming south of Kilauea, which is still under the sea level, and that they're moving to the Northwest toward Japan. So as we come up to this end, uh, they have become dormant. They're either sinking under the sea, you see the sea level, or uh, they're kind of petering out. But there are some that are still active. So these hot spots come from weak spots in the tectonic plate as it moves and they're moving to the Northwest. There it goes again, I've got to quit doing that. I'm going to use this one. All right, so <clears throat> please move this window away. Why is it doing this? Can you see this box on here? Yeah. I don't know what that's from and I don't know how to move it. <laughs> oh dear. There it goes. No. Why is it doing this? I hate that. Yeah, I can't move it. I can't move it either. I just moved it some when I used the share the keys, but it it um uh, all right, it's kind of fading. All right, there we go. There we go. Let's hope it stays gone. <laughs> Okay, another little chart, and some of these are from the uh, visitor center in the Big Island at the National Park. So the ones we call Hawaiian Islands are these at the very south end. Oh, it's back. And all these have are previous islands that have fallen under the sea, under the sea level. Uh, some are have still a little bit above it, but they're not. Uh, most of them are not occupied. What is the matter with this? 
I don't remember this ever happening. Now it's gone again. Now it's starting up again. Ugh. Move it away from the shared application. I don't even know what that means. Mary, we're good. We can we can still see just fine. Well, should I stop sharing and try it again? No. No. Um, well, if you think it would be any different. See, it's coming and going on my screen anyway. Yes, it does. It fades in and out. Anyway, what happens inside this caldera is that there's a, a molten lake, a lava lake that forms. <clears throat> if you notice, this was 230 feet. Uh, it's now quite a bit deeper than that. At, at the, when I checked yesterday, it was 744 feet deep this lava lake, <clears throat> and it spews off fumes, uh, rich in minerals, these, these lavas are. So when we were there in, in 2011, this is what it looked like. They put in some little figures here in this picture just to give you a sense of the uh, scale of it. But the caldera formed by former eruptions is this big space. And the, uh, over, the overlook here, which is where the geological center is, had, had to be abandoned. And the road, the rim road had to be abandoned as you'll see some further pictures. So this is what it looked like when we were there from the Jagger Center. And at night they open it, not the Visser Center, but they put some lights on so you can go out in total darkness. Remember how far away from civilization we are. And Kilauea does not have very many homes or anything near it. So it, can begin, it gets very dark at night. So uh, this was the home of Pele, the uh, Hawaiian volcano goddess. And this is what it looks like at night, even back in 2011, before it got its um, new, new life of spouting out uh, magma again. So at the, this, at the uh, visitor center, they have these um, charts that you can see how the, uh, what, what the uh, volcano is doing, <clears throat> the eruptions. All of this at the top, from the, from the top, is the Kilauea caldera. And it, it uh, goes down about almost 2,000 feet to the lava lake, which is this right here. This, this is hot molten lava. You do not want to fall into that. It's just this part of it that, that's uh, erupting now. And there are several others. I think this one that's, that's erupting out to the side. So this is a map of what the lava flows have been like over the last 1,000 years. And you see Mauna Loa with that flow all the way down almost to Hilo. And this is the Kilauea flow right here. And this is in the thousand years. So most of this is young flow, as they say. All these, these have been, for the most part, um, over a thousand years ago with, with some, uh, a few more recent ones. But most of Kilauea is new, new land. So this is the eruption. Now, this is just a little detour of, of the update on Kilauea, what's happened since 2018. Just a couple of pictures of what that lava flow looked like as it uh, erupted in 2018, and it's forming new land off the south coast, making a new, making new land. Well, it's over a thousand acres already. Oops, there it goes again. Uh, here are some pictures from the lava flow in 2018. Over 700 homes lost in this area down here where it came off of here uh, and formed all this new land. This was a bay right here. And you can see the rim road is no longer drivable and how it just came down the, the roads and burned houses and everything in its way. It, the lava moves slowly, you can get out of the way. It's not like at Mount St. Helens where it exploded and you were done for. So this was our, our um, Ranger at the uh, at back, moving back to 2011, my first trip there. Uh, he, he, there's a magazine called Ranger Rick, but the, his name really was Rick something something, and so he was Ranger Rick, and he's showing us uh, some Hawaiian artifacts. This being a spear with shark's teeth on it, and some other things that are native to Hawaii. The, some of the uh, crafts things that they make there. One of the interesting things to visit at the national park there is the Thurston lava tube. And you can see in the chart here that when lava flows, it often hardens all around it and eventually flows out and makes a tunnel. So there is one of those uh, called the Thurston tube that you can walk all the way through it in the dark uh, from one end to the other. We also took a nature walk with one of the guides 
And as you'll see that it's heavily forested. Uh, this is a tropical forest. It rains nearly every day, just a little bit in the afternoon, just keeps things nice and moist and humid and wonderful for growing. When the first Hawaiians came, there wasn't anything growing there. It's in the middle of nowhere. It had no, no vegetation on it. So everything on the island that's growing was brought there by the Polynesians. Our guide here was showing us various things uh, in the forest. And one of them being a nurse log. And because when a tree falls, it rots out and new life forms from it. So all these fallen leaves, uh, fallen uh, trees, of course, they just leave there and they become the basis for new, new life forming. He also showed us uh, ginger that he had pulled up. Now, ginger is a beautiful red plant, which you'll see later and you've seen before if you saw my uh, gardens uh, uh, program. Uh, but they were very invasive. They were not brought by the Polynesians. They don't grow in Polynesia, but they grow in Indonesia. And they were brought later by Indonesians and they spread all over and they're very invasive. So he was pulling it up, which they do. <laughs> you might also see this barbed uh, wire fence along here or fencing, it isn't really barbed wire, but fencing and run it out. And these are from feral pigs, which also run wild, uh, brought by the Hol uh, Polynesians and also by the um, uh, people on Captain Cook's ship. And they let, let the pigs and the chickens run wild and they're still running wild in Hawaii. And they dig up everything too. So you have to fence them to keep them out. So a couple of things that we saw on this uh, trip, uh, the, the uh, guided tour was the, uh, the state tree, the ohia tree. These are nice little feathery red flowers on it when they fall. And the sign, do not feed the nene, which are the, the state birds. There are a goose. We never saw any. My first three trips to Hawaii until this last trip, we did say the nene in in uh, Kauai, we had a pair that were right outside our condo, banded. Of course, they know where they all are. There are very few of them left because they're pretty dumb. They will walk right out in the road and get run over. So you have to be pretty careful of them. But we didn't see any except in Kauai, but I'll show you a picture of what they look like. A very elegant looking goose. You see the bands on them. They know who they all are. So those were taken in, in, in Kauai, but um, that is the state bird. This is the uh, Volcano Art Center, uh, Visitor Center across the street from the Jagger Visitor Center that overlooks the crater with some lovely Hawaiian type of art in it that gives you an idea of what kinds of things are Hawaiian. And of course, Pele, the, the goddess of, of um, the volcanoes and their artwork with baskets and uh, all kinds of uh, things that they make. And if you like, you can take hula lessons or guitar lessons. You see the guitar chords in the background here. You can sign up to do all that stuff. Okay, now I'm gonna start really where we began with flying into Kona, which is on the West Coast. And uh, my friend Teresa and her two buddies and I drove along this road along here, made some stops at, um, at the bay where Captain Cook came in and uh, some of the Hawaiian uh, villages along here, along the Black Sand Beach to Kilauea and ending up in Hilo. <clears throat> so we'll kind of follow that route, skipping the Hilo part, the Kileo, Kilauea part, since we've already done that. So this is in Kona, along the road that runs right along the beach, right along the edge. You see the, one of the nice hotels in the back background. Of course, there are flowers just everywhere. Beautiful views of the ocean. Uh, very kitschy. These, these were places where the sailors came. Uh, particularly, you see this in Maui, uh, these kind of uh, fun little places to hang out. Everything's open air. Uh, temperatures range from about 75 to 90 all year round. Very little air conditioning. There might be some big fans, but usually everything's open air. Uh, some of the little Hawaiian girls and their lays and beads. So you see these all along the coastline. We can sit out and uh, watch the Sun Go Down, which is my background picture today. This is that view from the, the ocean in Kona. Kona was the first place too where the missionaries came in 1820. This was the first place, the first church built in the, the islands. At first it was uh, wood and thatch roof and they, then they kind of added this stone to it and made it a little more durable. All around the islands, you'll see these signs like this if it's in a historical place, Hawaiian's first church. And that, of course, that's in front of the, the uh, Moku Ai Kau Church uh, from Boston missionaries. 
And across the street is the uh, Huli Ke'i Palace, which is not really a palace, but the first governor's house, which was built in 1838. And, and one is just across the street from the other. So this is the original church, the first church in the islands. And it's the model of the brig Thaddeus, which came building, uh, is in the church, uh, bringing the first missionaries. Uh, they came at the request of this guy right here, Henry uh, Opukahaya. He was a Hawaiian who came back with some of the, the uh, uh, first people who came and asked that missionaries be sent to Hawaii. He became a Christian and brought the missionaries who were warmly received. And they built uh, churches and they built uh, schools for the Hawaiians. At first, they were, uh, uh, were received uh, well. So this is the first uh, governor's house in 1838. Uh, we moved down the coast then to this um, Hanukohau, Kohau, which is an early village uh, to where the Polynesians would, would live, did live. Uh, the population reached, uh, was, was a big population when they moved, when the uh, Europeans first came. But of course they did bring disease with them, particularly smallpox, and that um, was a problem for the natives there. So this would have been an area where the Tahitians would have settled along the coastlines and built their houses like these. And these, these thatched houses were just for sleeping. Um, the, uh, they pretty much lived outside. As I said, it was a warm climate and they, they were able to make things out of the leaves of the trees, mats and things like that. Uh, grow plants grew easily in this fertile soil because it was full of minerals from the volcanoes. So they brought seeds and they brought plants with them when they came. They also built fish ponds. And what, what they did with this, uh, not to make life too difficult, in fact, making life a lot easier, the, the tide comes in every day. And when it does, it rushes in these fish, uh, these narrow channels, and then they drop a, a board through there. And that keeps the fish inside the pond. And when the, the, the tide goes out, of course, the fish, uh, the, the pond gets extremely shallow and they can literally just pick them up. So by 1778, there were at least 360 of these fish ponds when uh, Captain Cook came. So they were very clever in, in having a, a diet that they could manage easily. This is the bay where Captain Cook came in, his first stop in 1778. You remember he went on to explore this, the uh, Pacific Southwest, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, came back again in, in 1779. When he came in 1778, this little bay right here was dedicated to the to a god, uh, Olono, I think it was. And um, so when these uh, people came in the big ship, they um, thought they were gods because uh, they came in these two ships and uh, they, they uh, you know, gave them food and, and uh, treated them very well. But in, in, uh, then one of the sailors died and they thought, mm, maybe he's not a god after all. <laughs> And we got a change of our mind about that. So when they came back in 1779, uh, actually they weren't too welcome. Uh, so uh, this was the sailor that died and was buried here at the at this cove and his uh, nameplate is still there. So when in 1779, when he came back, um, they started throwing stones at them uh, when they came. So he had worn out his welcome with the Hawaiians. <clears throat> and in, in fact, um, they, uh, he, uh, Captain Cook uh, went away from the cove, but he, he had a, a broken foremast on his ship and returned to the cove and uh, they stole a, a small boat off of his other ship and, you know, things got out of hand. So uh, they uh, start firing on them. They, one of the chiefs was shot and uh, anyway, Cook was killed and, uh, and well, along with some of the others and some of them were able to escape. But he was cook. He was uh, cook. Was cooked, <laughs> uh, not literally. But he he was killed by the mob, and he's now buried in the the cemetery in Kona. <clears throat> so the uh, the park that we visited had some interesting uh, things to see in it. The way Hawaiians would have lived, and you see some of the lava rock when it hardens, it, it flows. You know, like a 
uh, viscous mass kind of, and, and when it stops flowing, it turns into hard rock or semi-hard rock. Uh, lots of pictures of how the Hawaiians would have dressed, where they came from. They came here from, uh, as you see, the um, Tahiti and the Marquesas, which are just nearby, up to the Hawaiian Islands. <clears throat> Some of the boats they used to, to uh, traverse that 26, 2700 miles. I cannot imagine being out in the Pacific with those high waves and storms in these little boats, but that's what they did. Uh, come on back here. So they came like this in, um, across the ocean, not knowing what was there. Uh, it, it's debatable when this happened. Uh, the Tahitians probably came around the 1200s, but they're, they're finding now that there was sign of life there before that, uh, probably between 100 and 300 uh, in the time of Christ. Some of their uh, nets where they uh, dro drove, uh, could dry their nets, uh, one of the, God, the uh, king's house. And you see next to it some of these coups, which are the gods that they, they carved in wood. I guess the plural is ki'i, but a single one is a ku. Mary, does yes. the black, does that, the rock being black make it hot? No, these, these have, <clears throat> these have all hardened into rock and they're cooled off. But they're, they're from uh, anywhere from a thousand years old. Well, no, I mean, just like from the sun on any given day, does it absorb no. heat and then too hot to walk on? No, no, not, no. Mm -mm. Okay. No, we walked on it. It's very uneven. As you see, though, it's lumpy. Uh, it's hard to walk on uh, unless they paved it into roads, which, of course, they do in places. It's hard to walk on. Okay. As you see, it's very uneven. You can walk on it easily, though. They also had some games that they played. Uh, this is kind of like a chess game or something. We're not really sure what the game consisted of, but that rock was there with this. They played with stones. And also big sea turtles. They're probably uh, maybe two to three feet across. They're, they're big, big ones. I, I waited for him to get his head out of the water, but he never did do it but he was close to shore, but lots of them swimming in the water. <clears throat> These, they were originally um, had thatch roofs. It looks like they're rethatching that one. But they did settle all along this bay, and this is the place we're talking about right here. So let's move along now, skipping Kilauea, since we've been there to Hilo. And this is one of the, the African tulip trees which is a very pretty tree, another red one, uh, like the Ohia. Uh, Hilo is not a very large town either, about 43,000. These are all small, small towns in uh, the Big Island. Kona is even smaller. Have some beautiful waterfall, but look at the vegetation. It's just everywhere. It's just everything is just covered with vegetation. A nice market there. And I was especially impressed with these flowers. Now you know how we can buy flowers in the market getting uh, this is the ginger that's so rampant that they pull out. Uh, but people have it growing around their house and the heliconias. And there we go again. And the anthuriums, I'll see just hedges of it. These are tea leaves that they'll wrap these pots in. Uh, Mother-in-law tongue, this is the jasmine. And uh, the yellow is orchids. I'm gonna use this again. In Hilo, there are a couple of early churches. Uh, this Haile Congregational Church was built by the Lyman family, uh, whose house is across the street. Uh, St. Joseph's is just across the street as well. Another one, Central Christian Church. So the Lymans were David and Sarah Lyman who built this mission house in 1838. They built it, uh, it's the oldest wooden house on the island uh, using the, uh, the koa tree, which is a very hard, hard uh, wood. They grow really tall uh, and the Ohio wood. And it's on the, the, place, the National Historic Places uh, list. And so their grandchildren uh, built a museum to house some of the artifacts that they had collected from early Hawaii, the Lyman Museum. And he has extensive collections. I was especially interested in the Philippines. You know, after the Americans came, uh, and they started growing sugar and pineapples a little bit later. 
um, they started importing laborers, mainly from the Philippines, from uh, China, Japan, Indonesia. So uh, these were uh, Philippines. There, there are a lot of Philippine uh, descent in uh, Maui, particularly. So this would be a typical Filipino home and artwork. In fact, Hawaii is the most, has the most diverse population of any of our states. Uh, there are people from all over that, that are there and lots of mixed race people. So in Hilo, there's a wonderful garden. I showed you some pictures of it in my American Garden uh, uh, presentation a few months ago. Uh, the legend of the two rocks is about a boy and a girl who were, gave themselves up to uh, be an impediment to uh, foreigners invading them in the harbor, supposedly. That's the story of the rocks anyway. Uh, but it is a rocky uh, place to come in and the garden itself is at the top of the hill. And in order to go down into it, you walk down a wooden path through it. And again, you see this dense, dense jungle um, and, and ponds in it, but you are going down into um, a canyon down towards the ocean. We grow these crotons, the, the orange that you see as house plants, <laughs> and they're just big as houses. And it's also the orchid island. We grow orchids. It says um, there are about 15,000 species of orchids. They have quite a few of them here. I'm not going to show you all of them. These are the Catalia orchids that they make the lays out of. And if you're a first time visitor to Hawaii, uh, you're supposed to get a lay at the airport when you come in. Now, Teresa knew that and I got my lay the first time. But after that, you don't necessarily get one unless you want to buy one. But different kinds of orchids, all different kinds. Um, they're all beautiful. They all seem to do just wonderfully well. Here's some of the Tahitian ginger. Most of them are red but there are several varieties of them. Uh, the, the Indonesian uh, ginger was what the uh, ranger was um, digging up at the national park. But they also come in a blue, which I didn't know until recently, and in a yellow, and I did not have a picture of that, so I borrowed that off the internet. But there are several different kinds of ginger. They make a, a very showy plant. The anthurium also is not only the red, which is the only thing I had seen, but it also comes in this white and pink. But I've seen hedges, literally hedges, along people's houses of anthurium. So you can just pick them if you've got them growing like that. But there's some other really beautiful trees. Uh, the clerodendron is, um, we've, we saw in Hawaii and in, uh, in, uh, Kauai as well, a big bush. Um, and Heliconia, as you see all over as well, the bird of paradise is in the Heliconia family and Poinciana's. <clears throat> it's an interesting one, a mule's foot fern. And this rose grape I thought was really beautiful. They're hanging down from a tree, the, the uh, a drooping flowers all over it. These green tea leaves are used for all sorts of things. They're a broad leaf. They make raincoats, thatch, hula skirts, all kinds of things out of them. They, you might be served a, a, a Hawaiian dinner on them if you go to a hula dinner on a big tea leaf. They, they can eat it. They do all kinds of things with tea leaves. And I brought back a little tea plant, which is still growing in my garden. I brought a couple plants back. That's the only one that survived. My jasmine didn't survive that. <clears throat> Here's another one that's a really pretty plant uh, that grows on a tree, cannonball. <clears throat> Being in this canyon, of course, there are waterfalls. And an interesting tree that grows is this uh, bakaruba tree, the roots out of the ground. Here's one of the ku, one of the gods named after an Hawaiian god. One of the things that we did in Hilo, you wouldn't get to do if you went. Uh, Teresa, since she lived there, she had friends with people all over the island. And one of her friends was this lady right here. Ma, uh, I'm sorry, not, not her. Another one who took us to, we stayed at her house. Ma, uh, Molly and um, I, I can't think of her, her husband's name now. They took us to a Friday night potluck dinner at Uncle Norman's. And he and his wife, who, who is right here, 
This is Uncle Norman and his wife. I've been living in, in Hawaii in Hilo for a long time. And like for 35 years, they had been having a potluck dinner in their carport every Friday night. And people just bring things. And he's a musician. So if there are any musicians in town or passing through, they are welcome. And they have a potluck dinner. And then everybody sings. And they play the, he plays the piano. And uh, it's a musical evening. So the way it starts out is um, his wife brings out a tray of Kahlua in these little tiny cups. And they sing this song that's up on, the, and I don't remember the tune to it, but these are the words. It says, let's have one in the house. Mr. Bartender, don't be a louse. As a rooster once said to the hen on the roof, let's have one on the house. So they provide the Kahlua and everybody drinks their little shot and then the proceedings start. And everybody fills up their plate and Uncle Norman um, and whoever musicians are around and there were several there that night get to play. And they do this every Friday night. And anybody's welcome. So moving on to Maui, we're going to look at Maui. Maui is also, of course, a volcanic island. One of them still a little bit active, uh, Haleakala. Uh, it's not a very big island. This is about 20, 22 miles across right here. My son lives up here, in, actually in Kahana, uh, Lahaina address. Uh, and we're going to look at a couple things here. Uh, Lahaina, of course, was a sailor's town, where uh, a whaling town where the sailors made uh, port. And up here at the end of it, which doesn't show on this map, Eo Valley, which is in the center of this dormant volcano. And uh, the trip to Haleakala for sunrise. And you've heard about the road to Hana, which goes around this way. It says there's a road over here, but, but don't, be, don't go for that. This is really not passable. There are other uh, towns along here, Kihei and some other towns on the Western side. So this is a, a, a beautiful place for these Western views of the sunset every night. And you can see them every night. They're just one after the other, beautiful views from the West coast of Maui. The island of Molokai looking out. And as I said, usually there's a little afternoon shower. This has got the rainbows, and so it's uh, humid, damp, and then it clears off. It might not rain where you are, but it's raining somewhere. Kind of a view of what that uh, driving along that West Coast road looks like. Uh, there are a string of resorts, golf courses, beautiful beaches. Uh, this is where I stayed both times I was there in 2014 and in 2015. The white flowers you see on these trees are the plumeria flowers. Uh, well, I've got a picture of those in a minute, all kinds of things you can do outside. Pools, of course, there's the plumeria. You see the Hawaiian girl with the flower behind her ear? That's, that's what it is, it's plumeria. Flower smells good too. So all uh, just looking out uh, from the hotels, the beaches all run one beside the other. So you can walk all along the beach. The hotel does not have access just to that beach. So no matter what hotel you stay in, uh, this is the Westin, uh, probably one of the most expensive ones, but you don't have to say that one. There are a lot of beautiful hotels along that, along the coast, looking out towards Molokai. And of course, when the sun goes down, then uh, the shows start and every hotel has hula shows, uh, different um, musicians playing Hawaiian music, uh, uh, Hawaiian buffet, that kind of thing. In the town of Lahaina, as I said, it was a sailor's uh, place where they came in, the whaling ships came in. <clears throat> Looks a lot like Kona, very kitschy. Uh, all kinds of little shops and places. This would have been from the colonial days, the wooden, the blue and white building. Uh, you can take whale watching trips. They, the time to go for whale watching is December through February. And the whales come, you can, they, you can see them right off the shore. Uh, and they come to have their babies here in the warm water of the Pacific, and then they will make their way up the coast uh, by California and through the uh, Inland Passage in Vancouver and up to Alaska, same whales. And you can, they are apparently uh, identifiable by mar the way they're marked on their tails and so forth. They can, they can spot which ones they are. So this is Front Street along the uh, ocean and the street, the main street that goes around the island is Hanoapililani Street. Now that one I can pronounce 
because my son lived on that street <laughs> for a long time. So I did get to pronounce that. That's the main road around the island, Hano Piliilani. Having some Chinese New Year's while we were there. Lots of shops, lots of things to buy, spend your money on. And you've seen these shields, of course, and know what those are, the little um, spears, hand spears. Lahaina was the capital. There were uh, kings on each of the islands for a long time until they were united by King uh, Kamehameha in 1845. And the uh, courthouse in Lahaina is interesting too. It's their museum as well as their courthouse, visitor center. And this banyan tree that grows out in the yard is just one tree. It puts down all these roots in one place and it has low branches, so it puts down more roots. And you have one tree just covering your whole patio. What a deal. <laughs> so inside, there's lots of history about the island, about the first people who came and what they brought, <laughs> and about the Christian miss missionaries who taught, uh, wrote down the Hawaiian language and, and taught uh, English and Hawaiian. And about the sailors, the, uh, the kings, the pineapple industry, and, and the sugarcane industry. And as I said, they did bring in people to work in the fields, as most people do. There is still sugarcane grown in Maui along that uh, central part between the east and west side. It's fairly flat, and um, you do see vegetables growing and, um, and sugarcane. So the road to Maui, uh, we came around around here, uh, again, not very far. And the road, the main road kind of peters out around here. And from there on, it's kind of you're on your own to get to, to Hana. Lots of curves, lots of waterfalls, because we're coming down from this volcano that's right next to us. The African tulip trees, and it's, it's foggy at this point. You see how what, what kind of uh, flower is on that tree once it falls to the ground. But every curve you go around, there'll be another waterfall, really pretty drive. Are the waterfalls um, warm water, like heated? I doubt it. I didn't uh, check to see. Um, I wouldn't think so. They're from the rain that comes every day. Oh, okay. Um, they're, they're not from the volcano itself. They're just, um, you just have a lot of water all the time. So there's always these waterfalls everywhere. And this uh, just just ju thick jungle everywhere as well. We stopped uh, almost at the way on the the um, almost Tohana at this black black sand beach, and you see the uh, lava rock here too. Uh, and the greenery was such a contrast to that black lava rock. But there was a little beach there that's a state park, and this is kind of a succulent that that grows. On, right, right on the rock. You wonder how anything can grow in the rock, but it is very uh, full of minerals. So it supports all this vegetation. And of course there is a historical sign there for the church here in built by the missionaries in, in Hana and just a little view out. The little town is almost nothing. There's only a few people live there. It's really out of the way. We, we went up to, to the very tip of the west part of it, to the, the two bays that are known for snorkeling. And you park your car and walk into this path. And of course, there are all these wild chickens everywhere in Hawaii. <laughs> I'm sure there are people that come and pick up their eggs or else they would be totally overrun with chickens. But there are chickens everywhere, uh, even in the cities. So as you come to the cliff side, you're overlooking these two bays. So you're coming up to these cliffs and looking down at these two bays. And there are all these signs that you must uh, pay attention to. But this is my favorite. Most days, Honolulu is one of the best places to snorkel. But if the wave's big or water is brown, it's no good for snorkel. <laughs> so if you pay attention to the sign, I guess you'll do well. The day we were there, there were plenty of people snorkeling. Uh, we could see up from that high cliff, uh, the condos, which are pretty pricey. And, and of course, um, uh, homes. But yes, there were people in the water and uh, I hope they were seeing lots of, lots of good snorkel. 
<clears throat> Moving now to Eel Valley. I must have gone by one. Let me let me go back here a second. Hmm. While you're looking for the slide you want, there is a question from yeah. uh, in New Jersey wondering uh, with all the the moisture and stuff, were there lots of bugs, insects? Um, I didn't really notice bugs, uh, mosquitoes, or no, I didn't. Um, I don't know if people had a problem with them. I didn't. Okay. I, I never found it bugs in Hawaii or in Maui. No, I, I haven't either. I, I, I'm not sure why. <laughs> I don't know what the birds eat. Anyway, this is Eel Valley, and it's in that uh, small uh, crater on the uh, north e northwest side of the island. Well, I keep doing this. But it looks like something out of a science fiction magazine or something, movie. You know, it's just completely covered with moss and greenery and vegetation and the waterfalls coming down through their hiking trails. Uh, a really kind of eerie place. <clears throat> so there's a comment, Mary, that uh, the chickens, all yes. those chickens are well fed and perhaps they're eating the bugs. <laughs> Maybe it is the chickens. I might have to look into that. Why, why are there no mosquitoes? What about those chickens? <laughs> okay, our last uh, excursion I'm going to show you is the road to Hana. The thing to do um, is to, I'm sorry, to Haleakala is to go to uh, for sunrise at Haleakala. So we were duly up at 4.30 in the morning and made that winding road trip up to the top. And this wasn't the best sunrise in the world, but it's all I got, folks. This, is, this was it. It wasn't great. But uh, being on top of Haleakala was sort of interesting because um, it, there's not a lot of greenery up there. It's still pretty bare, uh, kind of like a Martian landscape. This reddish soil that you see is from the minerals, particularly iron in the uh, soil. And it's a, a really bleak landscape. It's they made some for some interesting pictures. And over here, you see where the crater is itself, this area over here, and the overlook to it. So we made our way over there. And you can see that it's still putting off a little bit of stain, not too much. But one of the interesting things about Haleakala is the plant that grows there. And it's the silver sword. And it's the only place in the world that this plant grows. Now, my son is six foot three. So you get an idea how big this plant is and it blooms like, it's kind of like the uh, century plant. It blooms like every 20 years or so and then, then it falls over and dies. So we saw some of these uh, that were like this one that had kind of, I don't think it's bloomed yet. This is the bottom part, it's starting to bloom, but had uh, fallen over and died. But a very unusual plant, the only place you'll see it. So since we got up so early, we stopped here for brunch on the way down. Uh, this side of the mountain is called upcountry. It's a little bit uh, not as humid and not as hot as down on next to the ocean. Uh, so if you were wanted to move there, it might be a, a nicer place to live. And back out, they had these beautiful flowers and little, little places you could sit. Uh, nice, um, cheerful place. Lots of nice restaurants. So just ending up with some of the beautiful shots from Hawaii, everybody says it's so photogenic and of course it is. Uh, you can just take photos all day long and fill up your phone or your camera with them. Because every place you look, it's beautiful. It's a surfer, some good surfing in places. Of course, if you're there at the right time, you can see um, some of the wildlife. He's pretty. He's pretty, isn't he? Yeah. I did not get a good picture of the humpback whale. That is from the Pacific Whale Institute. The one I took is on the right. I uh, didn't see very much of them, but of course, James living there, he says, sometimes people are late for work because they're, they're just out watching the whales. <laughs> they're along Front Street watching the whales. And it, But you know, it's Hawaiian time and nobody seems to mind if you're a little late for, for work if they're watching whales. So they're still fascinated with them even, even being there that long. So the sunsets, of course, are, are legendary in, in Maui, beautiful every night. You just uh, can take them and fill up your camera. Is Maui mostly a um, tourist 
island yes. of yes. like all, all, all of Hawaii, their main main uh, industry is tourism. Tourism. Yeah, uh, they do a little bit of growing, but but even so, they're still importing nearly all their food and, of course, everything mechanical. Uh, Honolulu, we'll talk about uh, next week. They do have some industry, mainly high tech, but but it's still um, still not uh, not anything but tourism for to. Uh, okay. So well, I hope you'll be back with me next week to see the rest of flash. the rest of this. I'm sorry, what, what was that? Have you ever seen a green flash? A green flash, uh, like what? It's sunset. At sun, and sunset. And there sunset. Are, I have not, no. There is reputedly a green flash. I, I lived in Hawaii for a while. I never saw one. No, I haven't. You're not talking about like, uh, like uh, kitties of northern lights, are you? It's too far south for that. No, oh, this no, this no. is a uh, I've I've seen it in off of um, off of Florida and off of Bahamas, and it's the same thing. It's just when you have an ocean sunset right at the moment, there, and I, and sometimes people say it's actually your eye doing a shift. Yeah, oh, it actually happens. But, in but it is, but it looks like a bright like a like a green light going off for just. Mm -hmm. a, yeah, we saw it in Key West. Oh, no, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. Have I've not seen it in, in the ocean around South Africa. We get them in California too. Oh. I saw, I see them in, um, in Oregon, but it has to be perfect. There can't be any cloud in the sky. It has to be very, it, very clear. The sun goes below the horizon. Is that when you, when you see the flash? It's when the sun is it when the sun goes down or when it touches the horizon? No, when it goes down, right, right, it, as it, right as it drops right. below it. You know, so exactly at, at the sunset, the second of sunset. But like you're saying, um, Charlene, you'd only see it on a perfectly clear day. Clear and you're day. generally looking, I don't know if you can see one over the land, but you can see it over the water. Over the water. That's where I've seen it. Um, but don't they say, isn't there a folklore saying that that's when all of the bad spirits leave the ocean or leave the earth or something? I don't know. I've, I've heard all kinds of stories. If we look at some of the other questions that were in the chat, we have a little time to do that since we're not going to have a recipe tonight. Yeah, let's see. Well, let's start at the beginning. Um, a little late for sound. I hope we... We have that cleared up. Yeah, a couple of us said it, our sound was good. So um, you were talking about the, the volcano in Italy, and Carol said maybe Mount Vesuvius. Yeah, I was thinking, thinking of Mount Etna, actually. I did think of it. Uh, that's still active. Uh, Vesuvius oh, okay. is not active anymore, but, but I think Etna is. OK. Go, Jack. Um, <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, and if, if the chickens, and we're not allowed to chase chickens, children. <clears throat> that, that seems to be a pastime, uh, but they, they, uh, they frown on that. They're protected, basically. Okay. Uh, did you ever go swimming in the ocean, and was it cold? <laughs> uh, I'm not a swimmer. You will see me in a swimsuit in the next, next part next week, but I am not a swimmer. My children love it. They're all water people. Um, but no, I never even had my toe in it. So I, okay. it, it's cold, I'm assuming it is. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know. Uh, the whales, whales come because it's warmer there than in Alaska. So I guess it's not as cold as it could be. I don't right. know. There. They, they swim. I mean, people swim in the mm. ocean all the time there. It's and my children did, but I, I didn't. I'm not a swimmer. I when used to swim frequently when I was living there. Want to travel to Maui? Well, I hope you do. I, I it took me to 2011 to get there. Ten years ago was my first trip to to Maui, uh, to to Hawaii at all. And uh, you know, I just I had this idea in my mind that that it was just touristy and beaches and sunset, and there was nothing else. And that is not true at all. There is so much to see there, from a geology standpoint and a history standpoint. Next. Next week will be more about the history. Uh, there's a wonderful history museum in Honolulu, the Bishop Museum. 
And uh, I want to take you through that and, and through Kauai, which is like the Garden Island, which is just gorgeous too. So um, it has its own uh, wonderful things about it. Uh, and I'd love to go again tomorrow if I could. Um, because you have family there, um, uh, did you take any tours? I mean, like, I assume you kind of explored it with your family instead of, yes. did you look into tours to take or? Well, I was fortunate the first time in 2011, February of going with someone who had lived there. Right. Then when I went back with James uh, in 14, we met in the Big Island and I was his tour guide because I kind of knew where to go. He had been living in Maui for three years and had never been off of Maui. Oh. So so I took him um, to Mau to Honolulu, I'm sorry, to Big Island and Maui. Then the next year we met in and did the same thing. I, we met in Honolulu and we did a tour there. I'm gonna show you that next time. We did one tour there. And when I was in Honolulu with Teresa, she did not even have a car. We didn't take tours, but she we rode the local bus everywhere and did fairly well with that. There's some things you can't see with without a tour and that's why I did with James to Pearl Harbor. Um, okay. If you had a car, there's a lot more you could do and I did not have a car. In Kauai, we did have a car. Oh, okay. Does but anybody I, else have any questions of Mary? That was a fabulous presentation as always. I um, did not check on the quarantine. Uh, they were doing quarantine. Each island was quarantining people. So if you did a multiple stay and had to quarantine a week or two weeks each place, you know, it'd take you forever to, to do that. I don't know how they're uh, opening up. They've been very, very cautious because they have international visitors, of course, and American visitors all the time. I mean, there's just a steady stream. I know you can fly directly from, from Dallas to Kona to, uh, I'm not sure about Hilo, but to, to Honolulu, to... Um, Hawaii to Maui and fly each of the islands direct flights. So there's there's a lot of people going to Hawaii. Well, uh, I on that. Oh, of people that are on tonight that have been. Um, I think there are a fair number of people that are on the call tonight that have been to Hawaii. Yeah. And I was just curious if um, uh, like any of them either did tours or did you do the cruise ship that stopped at all the islands or, you know, said, can anybody kind of weigh in on how they saw the, what their trip was? Janice? Janice. Oh, you're I'm, muted, Janice. Turn your mute off. I took one trip that was by cruise ship from island to island, et cetera. And another one where we flew into, um, you know, the main island of Oahu, and then we flew to each island and so forth. So I have been there twice, and the people there are so friendly, and they just, they just enjoy their time. And the, one of the things I learned was they, they showed us how to say this. This means hang loose, hang loose. And so if you're, if you're rushing around, they're gonna give you the sign, hang loose. And that's true, it's a great place to relax. The word, the word to, two words you need to know, and one is aloha, which of course is welcome and uh, good cheer and all that sort of stuff, and mahalo, which is thank you. And you hear those all the time and you'll, you'll be losing you them yourself before you leave if you don't learn anything else. Uh, we did take one other trip in Kauai and that was a, a dinner cruise along the Napili, Napili coast, which is, unless you're an awesome hiker, about the only way you can see it, the best way to see it really. So we, we did that as a, a tour, a day tour. Okay, um, Marjorie, do you have a question? Uh, no, I was just gonna say that we spent a week uh, on the big island and we spent another week on Oahu and it, it's amazing how different they yeah, are. They are. All, all the islands are so different. Yeah. But it's, it's, uh, it's really worth going over there to see 
first of all, the natural beauty and, mm -hmm. and second, the culture. It's just, it's, it's really a wonderful place. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I just fell in love with, with it. And of course, I have a son who's never coming home. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is home. I don't know. He's, he's been there, uh, what, nine years now. So I said, well, is your plan to stay there forever? And he said, well, it's so expensive to live here. Of course, it's the most expensive state. And he said, if I could afford a little house in the upcountry, I'd move, I, I'd commit to staying here forever. So I don't know what, what he'll do, you know, eventually. He's, he's got it worked out now, but it isn't, hasn't always been easy for him to live there. Kathleen? Um, uh, my my yeah. wife and I have been to Hawaii several times. Probably um, each island has its um, um, s special areas for us. Uh, but um, the Kona side is the dry side. Hilo seems to always be raining when we're there. Um, uh, we did go when the uh, volcano was flowing and we took a helicopter ride over the flow. And that was really nice. Uh, we took, uh, as uh, someone just mentioned, a um, uh, um, seven-day tour just around the islands on um, the Norwegian uh, Pride of America. And uh, so they stop at each island uh, for a day. Um, I think that maybe even at, on Maui, they do it overnight so that people can take that drive to um, Hana. And we've done it a couple times. Uh, but the very first time was probably the best. And that's when we were just staying with a friend in Maui. And he said, it looks like it's going to rain. This would be a good day to go to Hana. And I thought, in the rain? But that was awesome. you take the advice of the locals. And he was right. Because as it rains, those waterfalls fill up so quickly that it was very, very dramatic. And... Uh, we stayed for about 10 days and we decided to take a second trip on a nice sunny day and the waterfalls were not nearly as dramatic as they were uh, when it was raining. Uh, my friend also mentioned, by the way, we went out to Malakini, which is a sunken volcano. Um, it was kind of expensive. I don't take many tours, but I really wanted to go out there to this um, Malakini. Uh, snorkel. to snorkel and uh, you supposedly can see beautiful fish and um, turtles well we saw lots of fish but every one was exactly the same one and we saw one turtle when we got back to our friend he said well go over um, on um, the uh, opposite side of the island the same side of the island as Lahaina but go to the opposite end, not Kalapani, uh, but the opposite end. And he said, sometimes you can see turtles right on the shore. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And sure enough, we saw turtles right on the shore for free. And uh, then we snorkeled and we saw turtles in the water. I'll never forget my wife yelling in the water, underneath the water, look at the turtle. And it was swimming about eight feet below us. Mm -hmm. And just swimming along, minding its own business. Yeah, they're they're great big things. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, David. Um, you know, it is after um, eight o'clock Eastern time, and so um, I just want to really thank Mary for the presentation um, tonight, and uh, we'll have the second half next week. Um, well. <laughs> What? I said, as they say in Texas, y'all come back now. Yeah, definitely. Um, and then on May, so that's May 2nd. And then May 9th, actually, Jack and I are going to go on a vacation. So we won't be here. <laughs> so there won't be any program. And where we're going, there's no electronics. So we can't even host it from where we're going to be. So um, but then we'll pick back up again. And um, in fact, the, the day we're, the night we're gone, you all can go to the YouTube channel 
And there was a link in the invitation this time um, that when it said that the recent um, Croatia programs are now on the on the YouTube channel. So you can watch those if you miss them. Um, and there's a link to it under that. And so um, you can just look and see at the different programs um, that we've done. So um, 